with a discussion of Carbon-14, Geologic Time Conclusion completes the review of the radionuclides used to date rocks, and then describes the procedures and instruments employed to reveal their hard-to-read clocks. But first, and as listed on these slides, a summary of the essentials of the introduction movie. The Earth is between 4.5 and, and 4.6 billion years old. Before its creation, long-lived radionuclides were formed by the explosion of supernovae, explosive nucleosynthesis, and so form a minute part of the rocks at the surface of our planet. Eight still usable radioactive isotopes are listed here. Their rate of transmutation to a stable daughter element is unchanging, immutable. The decay constant, so it provides a means of measuring the time elapsed since their formation. This rate of decay is expressed in terms of half-life, the number of years required for half of the unstable element to convert to its stable form. It is obvious that carbon-14's half-life is so short that it must have a discrete origin, and so it does, for carbon-14 is being produced in the upper atmosphere right now, most abundantly at about 50,000 feet. These four slides together provide a complete explanation of the process. Cosmic ray neutrons collide with any atom to produce an energetic neutron, which in turn collides with an atom of nitrogen-14. The nitrogen-14 atom loses a proton, so it's converted into carbon-14. The carbon-14 atom soon unites with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, a gas that forms a small part of the envelope of air around our planet. Plants convert carbon dioxide into the sugars that nourish them. Many animals eat plants, so as long as they live, they maintain a constant level of carbon-14 in their bodies. After death, the decay of carbon-14 to nitrogen-14 continues, but it is no longer replenished, so its ratio with respect to that of the stable carbon-12 isotope decreases at the rate defined by the decay constant, so age at death can be calculated. But in the past, the amount of C14 in the atmosphere was not uniform, so its variations have been calibrated for well over 8,000 years before the present using tree reeds, and to about 45,000 years before the present in the limestones deposited by dripping water in caves. And varves in lakes and some marine sediments help confirm findings. Nevertheless, the possibility of considerable error remains, not only in the accuracy of the measurements, but also in the possibility of contamination by existing carbon-14. Here is a list of most items for which a C14 age has been determined. Note the inclusion of shells and foraminifera and the emission of ice cores. And here is a chart showing the age of some important Pleistocene and Holocene archaeological finds and related paleontologic dates. Carbon-14 dating has been used extensively in determining the migrations of man and the times of extinction of the larger Pleistocene mammals and other animals worldwide. My discussion of the theoretical aspects of how radionuclides are used to date rocks, albeit cursory and incomplete, ends here. But what procedures and instruments are employed to make the actual measurements? This chart lists the elements used for dating and the minerals that contain them. The treatment of a rock to be dated is straightforward, but for each of the methods listed on the chart, preparation of the host rock differs slightly. 
Here, an outline of the procedures followed in the uranium-lead method of age determination must suffice. Step 1. Fairly large quantities of the rock to be dated are collected, 2 to 30 kilos, about 5 to 70 pounds. The amount required depends on the estimated percentage of bulk volume occupied by minerals presumed to include uranium-bearing isotopes. 2. The rock is crushed and the heavy minerals are separated out according to their density and magnetic properties. 3. Grains or crystals of the minerals capable of containing uranium are selected under a binocular or electron microscope. Crystals range in size from tens of microns to several hundred. A micron is one millionth of a meter. Four, for measurements of isotope ratios in the common type of secondary ion mass spectrometer, SIMS, the crystals are washed, weighed, and dissolved in acid. Uranium and lead are separated out using ion exchange chromatography and in a thermal ionization mass spectrometer are mass analyzed for uranium and lead content. Chosen specimens are then subjected to a SIMS analysis. Here are three diagrams of the SIMS setup. All exhibit the same set of devices in an identical succession. The third one color codes these steps. In yellow is a generator of a primary ion beam of oxygen or cesium and the ion gun that focuses it. The kinetic energy of the beam on the target causes sputtering, an ejection or plasma of which a small portion is ionized. In blue, it's a complex apparatus that electrostatically funnels and guides these secondary ions to the mass spectrometer, colored orange. There, strong magnets separate these fast-moving ions according to their mass, their atomic weight. The detection and storage data apparatus is in green. It always includes a Faraday cup and often an electron multiplier. Here is a secondary high-resolution ion microprobe shrimp installation, color-coded in the same way, along with snaps of other shrimps. Six, the shrimp ion gun, its microprobe, is different from those of other secondary ion mass spectrometers for its tiny beam covers an area of only 5 to 30 microns in diameter and focuses directly on an untreated target mineral, preferably polished zircon crystals embedded in epoxy. Preparation time is thus much reduced and the ability to make more than one reading on a sample from its study of its thermal history. This is a zircon crystal from a metamorphosed sediment in Western Australia. The age of the area circled is calculated to be 4.4 billion years. Other sonal areas on the same specimen are younger. This too brief discussion of the procedures and instruments involved in determining the chronologic age of a rock or fossil has, I hope, shown you that such dating is an application of sound and reliable science. Measurements repeated many times provide a figure and a range of error that can be considered dependable. But all such measurements can be wrong if the clock has been reset by great heat. And there are many other less easily detected pitfalls particularly troublesome in dating carbon-14. If this wordy and repetitious but still far from complete explanation of a fundamental of geology has not put you off entirely, Chapter 2, Rock Classes, will be posted in a month or two.